Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. It, it's great to be here. It's fantastic. I'd love to come every year, and um, I'll, I'll definitely try and get over to Hartford, Connecticut next year. Uh, Huckleberry Finn was one of the first books I ever read when I was seven or eight years old, and uh, I was probably too young for it at the time. Um, I'd like to say a big, big thank you to Tom Rednier as president for what he's done for, for the movement, and uh, I think it's been absolutely marvellous. And the way he handled the meeting today and the way he's had the different people doing things under control, I'm was, I was full of admiration for you, Tom, so congratulations from the De Vere Society on that one. Uh, I'd like to take up Stephen's point that he made, and Stephen, wave. Uh, I made a very similar point years ago, round about the year 2000, at a De Vere Society meeting, and the then chairman, Christopher Dam, said, fantastic, you are now our publicity officer. <laughs> and so I served for 15 or 16 years on the, on the uh, committee, and eventually I stepped down. The chairman is the powerhouse of the committee, and the president is meant to be sort of figurehead. I would like to introduce Amanda Hines, if Amanda would like to stand up. Uh, she's the new secretary, he's taken over. Um, Amanda's a real doctor, and with, with a specialism in histology, and this means that you take human tissue away, you subject it to intense scrutiny to see if it's malignant. She was attracted to the society because she saw James Shapiro's book on contested will. She subjected it to intense scrutiny, and she found it was malignant. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's today's gag. Um, this is a view across just north of London, just outside the city walls, and in the middle there is a tower which has been mistakenly identified as the Curtain Theatre, but almost certainly it is the theatre. And uh, so there have been some new excavations going on in London, and it was only last year I went to a meeting at Stratford-upon-Avon, and a, a lady from the Museum of London Archaeology, she gave a talk, and I suddenly said, woohoo! And um, when I mentioned it to other people, they, they weren't so excited, and I thought, mm, well, maybe I've got, got it wrong here. Uh, this road here, down at the bottom, is the Great North Road, and um, so you can see a lonely man with a, a cart there. Sometimes in rush hour, you get a second cart. <laughs> uh, this this Great North Road is, is, is known as Bishop's Gate today, and the bishop in question is the Bishop of Ely, and it heads north, and it goes off in one direction towards Cambridge and Ely, and then in the other direction up towards um, Stamford, which is where Burley House is, and then further north up to um, Newcastle upon Tyne and Edinburgh. So this is probably the most important road out of London at the time, and we're just outside the old city wall. Now, before I go any further, can I just ask how many people have been to London? Show of hands. Oh, that's it, virtually everybody. And can I ask how many people came in the footsteps of De Vere? Quite a few of you. Yes, yeah, lovely to see you. That was wonderful. That was a fantastic trip. Now, I'm going to ask three people to stand up, please. So first of all, Michael Morris, can you stand? Earl Showerman, can you stand? Bill Camerino, can you stand? And I'm just checking to see if they're still wearing the same clothes, but it is. It's only me. I sleep in this, by the way. I'm known on all the park benches around London. Um, you caught the train from Liverpool Street, and you can see the happy train driver waving at you. And just outside this, we'll, we'll be looking at it in a moment, is, is where the. Uh, theatre in the curtain were located. Uh, Anne, I'd like to pass on my best regards to her and, and best wishes. She organised the trip and that was absolutely wonderful. So uh, that was one of the best things um, that, that we've witnessed in, in Britain. Um, the reason I showed that picture was because it was one of the funniest things that's ever happened to me. And it was Michael Morse. And uh, just over here on the right hand side, oops, go back. Just over here on the right hand side, we've got Fisher's Folly, and this is 
bought by Edward de Vere in, not bought, rented by Edward de Vere from 1580. Did he buy it or did he rent it? He bought it. And uh, just down here is a convenience store, Tesco's, which um, Michael managed to get in. And there was this bemused uh, security guard, and he's, he's confronted by a group of us. Roger was there, I know. How, how, how many other people were there on that trip? And he said, these people want to come and see the foundations. <laughs> he went, you what? <laughs> You're kidding me, come on. And uh, we managed to get in and take pictures of the foundations. And one of the things that really surprised me was how deep these foundations are compared to the modern street level. Just opposite, the pointed with the yellow arrow, was the Church of St. Bottles without Bishopsgate. So without meaning um, outside. And we've got Bishopsgate down here and the old Roman wall, which was sort of rebuilt over the years, and it's, it's gone now, but it's, it's still visible just at the Museum of London, a bit further over to the west. So St. Bottles is quite important. There are four churches at the London city gates just outside, and he was the patron saint of travellers. So if you'd made it down to London without being molested and without being robbed or anything, you could go in there and give thanks. I know Roger was very keen to go into that one, and I didn't understand at the time, so I want to just uh, have a, a quick check. Uh, I don't know this part of London very well. I, I, I went up just a couple of months ago to sort of check it out, and I caught a bus, and so I, the, fortunately the bus stopped right beside the, the, the convenience store, so I was able to go in and take this picture outside on one side, and then directly opposite, so with the bus still stopped there, I was able to go and take this picture of St. Bottles. And this is a newer building, neoclassical, so it's post-1750, so it's not the building that was there in medieval times. But this has actually got quite strong connections with, um, with the theatre. So first of all, Edward Alain, who went on to become a great actor, Henslow, he was baptised here, I think, in 1566. Uh, somebody's going to get on Wikipedia and correct me, aren't they? Yeah. Um, Stephen Gosson was the, the vicar there, and in 1579, so just a couple of years after the theatres had opened, he was writing his School of Abuses. Then down on the left, we've got Emilia Lanier. She was baptised there, and then she was um, baptised as Emilia Bassano, and then she was married there as well, so Emilia Lanier. So she's a local person as well. Um, and then we've also got Ben Johnson's son was buried there in about 1603. So Ben Johnson wrote an ode to his son on, on his death. And William Shakespeare, when his son Hamnet died? No, not interested. Now, I think there are further connections. Does anyone know? Uh, Bill? Bedlam's just across the street, yeah. Uh, it's the same side as the convenience stores. So if I go back, and I think Bedlam is somewhere off to the right, and this was Bethlehem, and this is the uh, insane asylum, so probably all of us will end up there next time we go to London. Um, so Bishopsgate is the road running north, and just beyond it on the left-hand side is, is where there was a priory, Holywell Priory, that was dissolved in 1539. Now, some people ask me about the Great Fire of London, and of course, here in California, we're used to great fires, and um, I was seeing the pictures in San Francisco from 1906. I didn't realize that the earthquake caused some damage, but it was a subsequent fire that really destroyed it. And uh, the, the fire started in Pudding Lane, and there's a monument to it, you can walk up now, and the wind obviously seems to have spread from the north and east, and so the, the fire spread off to the west. Samuel Pepys, his home was okay, he was woken up and he wrote about it in detail in his diary, and the Tower of London was not affected, so the tower down here, but St. Paul's Cathedral, the old St. Paul's, was burnt down completely. Apparently it was in very bad condition, and so it needed, needed something to be done to it. Um, 
So that's just to show where things are generally, and Bishopsgate at the top right there is uh, the one that we're interested in. Um, I don't know if you all caught that, but Fisher's Folly, uh, Ron was saying, was the entrance was here at Bishopsgate, which is on the main road, but the estate stretched down to Aldgate, and that at Aldgate was the old Boar's Head Tavern, where there were plays there, and there were links to the Earl of Oxford as well. The other Boar's Head is down in East Cheap, is down here. Um, no, there. Um, Yeah. Um, I'm standing corrected here. Yeah, mistake to let people make contributions from the floor, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> a few years ago, um, this site was acquired by a modern developer, and this is what they've got planned. So there's going to be a lot of offices, a lot of um, apartments, and a lot of uh, retail space. And f fortunately, over the years, the attitude towards the underlying strata and some of the previous buildings has changed in London, and so they're attempting to preserve it, not just to allow the archaeologists in for 20 minutes to go and find whatever they can before the bulldozers come in. So what they're planning is having <clears throat> the base of the stage, as they're calling it, to be the curtain theatre, and they're going to build around it. They, they've rearranged things now. Uh, when I was there just a couple of months ago, the great big boards around, and I wasn't allowed into it, um, the, I missed, there was a Saturday when people were allowed to go and, to go and look at it. Uh, I don't think it's very exciting uh, what you can see. Right, so here we go again. The tower down here in Blue Square, Old St. Paul's, and just about half a mile north of Bishopsgate, we've got the theatre, which was the first one built in 1576, and the curtain, which is usually dated to about 1577. Right, I'm going to have to go back on script now. So here we have the old Holywell Priory. It was a, a convent of Benedictine nuns, I think, originally. And so there's a well, Holywell, and uh, this land was uh, free from the civil authorities. So that even though the, the monastery, the convent was dissolved, that the people inside it were beyond the reach of the, of the normal um, authorities. So the first one was built in as we can see, somewhere over there, they've, they've worked that one out. The second one, the curtain, is named after the curtain wall, which is sort of like a, a perimeter wall that went around the whole site. It's nothing to do with curtains that you put up on a stage. And Bishopsgate down here. Now, my friend and colleague, Richard Malin, who's just stepped down as Secretary of the De Vere Society, uh, wrote this book, The Earl of Oxford and the Making of Shakespeare. And he said that... The making of Shakespeare and the early modern theatre dates from 1576 because of the impetus given to it by the Earl of Oxford. So that the Earl of Oxford provided plays, he provided uh, the political awareness and understanding so that they could negotiate the authorities. Um, I, I want to add to this and say that he also, in my view, provided the venue, a theatre where they could be based. Um, the base is not just for their props or their costumes and their pageant wagons and, and even for themselves to live, but they could rehearse the place and develop their skills and perform for the paying public beyond the reach of the city fathers. The primary purpose of these players was to perform at court, and this is frequently overlooked, that usually from now on they're going to be talking about the troops as being independent bodies who went around doing things at different towns and cities and performing in London, and then occasionally as a bonus, icing on the cake, they were performed for the Queen. I think that the patrons, such as the Earl of Leicester and the Earl of Warwick, they used these people much more importantly for their own means, and that they were, they were primarily serving 
their own performances before the court and then in the meantime they could go off and, and do other things. So this is, this is my view. Uh, let's begin with a, a review of the theatre. Um, octagonal or, or polygonal building and we know that timbers were, were taken down in 1599, transported across the Thames, which is almost certainly frozen at the time, and reassembled into what we call the globe. The reason we know so much about it is because there was a lot of litigation and therefore the court records tell us about the, the theatre, whereas we don't have so much about the curtain. Holywell Priory, by 1576, the land was owned by one Giles Allen, and he agreed a lease on, on Lady Day, which is 25th of March, for 21 years with James Burbage and his brother-in-law, John Brain. Burbage was a carpenter and the father of Richard Burbage. Their annual rent was 14 pounds, so by performing in this, they could expect to make 14 pounds back from groundlings paying a, a penny here and there. So far, so much in line with the sort of established history of the early modern theater. What is overlooked is the enormous cost of construction. E.K. Chambers reports that Burbage put down 200 pounds and then another 400 pounds towards the cost of the construction. So that's 600 pounds. Now, you're not going to make that in just performing for people here in their penny entry or, or by traveling around. This is an enormous outlay, and I think there's only one person who could have done that, and that was Burbage's patron. Burbage's patron was the Earl of Leicester, and the Earl of Leicester, coming out of prison in um, 1558, uh, set about, he had his own troop of, um, of players, and he needed to do that in order to sort of promote himself. He was quite a strong Protestant, so he was sort of trying to push the Puritan agenda more than others, and they, they went around wearing his livery, and um, in the same way as other people did. Well, in 1572, the Privy Council, of which he was a member, said, no, you are not allowed to do this. And uh, so they, they came up with the Vagabonds Act, and the petition of Burbage was to try and make sure that they were still allowed, and they had to go and have their status increased, uh, improved, so that they could carry on and do that. Now, two years later, um, they receive a royal warrant. So the Queen allows them to go and, um, and push themselves around. In 1575, they perform at Kenilworth. So we all know how important those were from the point of view of the Earl of Leicester. And then a year after that, they are building the theatre in London. I think it, it's obvious where the, the connection is and where it's going. Now, his players continued until 1583, and we'll talk about what happened after that in a moment. Now, the, the curtain is not known so well because it is not the subject of, of um, litigation, but it's probably this building over here and um, there, there are a number of references, usually from people like Stephen Gosson saying about vagabonds and, and prostitutes and uh, dicing and all sorts of things going on. Um, we don't know who was running it and we don't know who owned the land. But there is a mention of the person who owned the land was a William Allen who was connected with St. Bodolph's Church and is the former mayor of London. And um, if I get a chance, I'll talk about him. Um, Tiffany Stern suggests the curtain was a hireable space, so it wasn't dedicated to one particular troop, and I think that seems to fit in with the, the, the known evidence that we have. But in addition to the plays that were put on there, there were displays of fencing and sword fighting, and often for prizes. Um, the curtain was, was mentioned often in the same breath as this theatre, but sometimes in a less than complimentary way. Eventually, the curtain was assigned for use solely by the players of Queen Anne, but that's not until 1604. Now, what was the curtain like? Well, when there was a big earthquake, well, how big an earthquake, but, but quite big um, in... 
1580 on 6th of April. Both venues were, uh, they had performances in there. And there's descriptions of people jumping from the upper floors of the curtain. So we're talking about two or three stories at least, three stories high. Um, so Thomas Churchyard wrote about it. Another one who wrote about it was Monday and a couple of others. And they seem to be actually connected with Oxford, but they're writing from it from a sort of disapproving um, point of view, as if this is you know, bad, we, we, we shouldn't be having plays going on for themselves. Uh, John Marston, down here at the very last line, talks about curtain plaudities, but when he mentions Romeo and Juliet, does he mean only that play, Romeo and Juliet, and only at the curtain, or is Romeo and Juliet a sort of a, a metaphor, I think, metonym for a kind of play such as, or a kind of theatre such as? So some people say Romeo and Juliet was performed there. I think it's it's quite possible from what, what John Marston's saying, but not absolutely sure. Now, uh, two things that have been discovered. So far, this is all, all established. Firstly, when they actually excavated it, they found it was a rectangular building and that the stage ran along the long length of it. So if you imagine from where I'm standing over to the wall was about the length of the stage. And that if you go backwards that way, and it's a very strange shape. They're not expecting to find that. They were very, very surprised. And what they felt that, that allowed was to have more people involved in fight scenes, and it was the same length as a sort of fencing contest, and that you could have these sort of big action-packed adventures going on compared with a more intimate um, polygonal globe with this sort of small, small um, stage in the middle of it. So that was the first surprise. The second surprise was this manuscript that was found in the Vatican archives, and it was in French, and it's a guide to London, 1578, and it's called The Singularities of London. So it's just been published in London by the Museum of London Topographical Society, and he mentions a couple of things about the, the theatres. So first of all, at one end of the meadow are two very fine theatres, one of which is magnificent in comparison with the other and has an imposing appearance on the outside. Well, I think that's the theatre, the first one that's built and is subsequently dismantled. The second thing that this chap says, so his name is Grenard, he's French, uh, and it's in French originally, one of the playhouses was erected by a great lord. So this is why I think that the, the first one, the theatre, was probably built by the Earl of Leicester. Now, where does the Earl of Oxford come into this? Well, here's some gaps. He arrives home in 1576 from his travels. He's got a keen interest in drama, which we know about. Um, he's trying to fend off all these comments about his wife's infidelity. But what is he actually doing, apart from selling his, um, his, his estates? So this is a... In 1580, we know that he takes over Warwick's men. Uh, Ambrose Dudley was Robert Dudley's older brother. He ran his own players. He was the master of the ordnance, and he'd been badly injured about 15 years earlier, and he was hobbling around. He too was a member of the Privy Council, but was taking less and less interest in what was going on, which is why his players get taken over. So I'm interested in these three years in blue as to what he was doing. But 1580 is obviously a key year, so this is when Michael Moore's bought Fisher's Folly for him. And then at the same time as he takes over the players, and for three years he's running his own players until they are taken away from him by Walsingham. Now I went along and I looked at the different plays that are recorded as being performed at court. And so I've got a list of these. So I've got Warwick's Men, The Painter's Daughter, and I've got the Children's St. Paul's Error, and, and some other ones as well. Not always are they mentioned in the titles. Sometimes you just know who the players were. But these are the ones which have been identified by Oxfordians as likely to have been written by Oxford round about this time. So we've got Error, which is obviously the Comedy of Errors, Titus and Gisippus, which is two noble kinsmen, no, Gentleman of Verona. Sisters of Mantua, because he's just been to Mantua. Cruelties of Stepmother, Cymbeline. Rape of the Second Helen, Troilus and Cressida, and so on. 
So we think that, that he's, he's writing these plays. I would say that he's using the curtain theatre to prepare them away from court so that when he comes to court, we've got this fantastic performance of plays which is promoting himself, promoting his own view, promoting his own thing. Now, during this period, 78, 79, is when Allenson was in London and um, Oxford was sort of favorable to this marriage and Leicester was, was really badly opposed to it. And that's part of the falling out of the tennis court with uh, Sydney is the, the sort of underlying disagreements that they've been having. So my suggestion is that in 1577, he helped set up the curtain but he doesn't have so much ready money as the Earl of Leicester, so it's a slightly inferior one. But he has it on a different plan because he himself is very interested in fencing. We know he won at tilts and, and all sorts of things can be um, uh, rehearsed there. He allows various companies to, to use it and he uses the different companies and says, look, I've got a play for you here. Why don't you go and put that on? I say, fantastic. So we've got Sussex's men, and we've got Worcester's men, and we've got Warwick's men, and they're putting on his plays, not necessarily understanding the purpose behind some of it. Um, in 1580, he, he becomes more overt about it. He takes over his own men. He moves in nearby Fisher's Folly. He's got his writing circle around him with Monday and Churchyard and Lily and all the others. So... The two points that have come that are new is, first of all, the shape of the stage, and secondly, that there's a great lord involved in building them. And I think that we ought to consider how Oxford might have been involved in the construction and the use of those venues as playhouses, as rehearsal rooms, before he transferred over. Sorry, sorry, we're out of time. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, excellent. Uh, the uh, point I'd like to make is that uh, Warwick's men were not totally taken over in 1580. They lost their two best actors to, to Oxford, the Duttons. Uh, what actually killed Warwick's men was the formation of the Queen's men, they were all supposed to dedicate their best actors, and Warwick's only had a couple of actors. So, they <laughs> so that wrecked them. Yeah, um, very good point there. My impression is that in the years, in the early 1580s, it's Leicester's and Oxford's men who are performing at court, that Warwick's men have lost their prestige and they lost their importance. And I think it's due to, to Ambrose becoming ill and, and, and beyond things. Uh, so... Uh, Oxford has already been, obviously, to England well before the, I mean, to, to Italy well before this. And are you suggesting that the stage there in this rectangular theater was a standard proscenium, you know, a standard stage? I wouldn't have said there's uh, a proscenium, no. I think that it's just a bit like this, how you, you just stand up and you perform and you come along. And we heard the other day from Catherine uh, about what Sydney, Philip Sidney was saying, you know, that people come on stage and they say, oh, look, here we are in a forest, and they have to pretend you're in a forest. So I think that the, the people, the, the, the directions and the scenery is given by the, the actors as part of their, uh, of their uh, script. Do you know anything about the Italian, what the Italian stage looked like at that point? Do we know anything? No. Uh, Stephen? Well, well f yeah, f Philip Sidney is rusticated. He's sent off to the country and he goes down to Wilton House near Salisbury in 1579. And at some point he writes his defense of poesy, which is defending the way he did things and, and attacking that. But um, he's away then for about two years, so it's likely that that's where he's, he's done it. And then he's sent abroad and then he dies in 1586. So it's... it's Datable between 1579 and 1586, but more likely to be closer to 1579. But enough for him to have seen plays like this uh, at court. 
No, I, I would say that the design came as, as probably using some of the original walls and some of the original buildings and adapting them because it, was a, it had been a monastery. And so they say, right, lads, what can we do here rather than starting from scratch, which is what they did at the theatre. Um, Bob? All right. Okay, one more. Uh, just to bring this into the present day, when I went on the trail of Edward de Vere and I was with Michael Morris looking at Fisher's Folly, we thought, gee, wouldn't it be great if someone could develop an app that was a virtual, a virtual trail of Edward de Vere so that you could go to the site of the current Fisher's Folly and point your cell phone and get a little bit of information from the web about Edward de Vere. And so looking at your talk, I realize there's, you're doing more research for finding out more about sites like where was Edward de Vere in London? Where was he in England? And it's, it's just an idea to plant. We don't have anyone who can do this work, but I think it would be a great way to get people involved in uh, the story of the Earl of Oxford. I just have one question. I'm new to this all. This is my first conference, and I wanted to know what, what you began talking a little bit about Walsingham and when he came into the picture. And can you explain a little bit just about answer? Um, I, I don't know the details, but Andrew Gurr has said that the rivalry between Leicester's men and Oxford's men at court got out of hand. And Sussex was the Lord Chamberlain. He also ran his own players. And one of his players was Tarleton, was the clown. And when Sussex dies, Walsingham steps in and sets up the Queen's men. They're set up in 1583, and they take the best players from the different companies. So it sort of like removes their, it's, it's like you know buying up the best f f soccer players or, or, the, or the best people. And after 1583, it's only the Queen's men who are allowed to perform at court. So I don't know enough about the situation there to say, is it Walsingham himself? Is it with Burley's connivance? Is it by, by diktat of the Queen? But, but one way or another, they are scuppering what these, these uh, squabbling courtiers were trying to do. By 1583, Leicester's out of um, favor. There's some doubt as to when the Queen found out that he was actually married. Um, but I didn't mention Twelfth Night, almost certainly to do with Alonson, Midsummer Night's Dream as well, and they've got to be dated to the late 1570s as well. Uh, we can put on there, I can do this, I'm sure other people have done it, where Oxford lived when. Yeah. Last. That's it. That's it. Thank you very much, Kevin.